the linguistics. Welcome back to Florida Linguistics Podcast listeners. This is the podcast for Wednesday, December 29th, 2009. I'm Lee Ballard, grad student in linguistics at the University of Florida, and I'm here today with my other grandmother, Mrs. Virginia Ballard. Hello, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Mrs. Ballard is a native speaker of English, but is also fluent in French and served the Maryland Public Schools as a teacher and supervisor for approximately 30 years. She's here today to share her experiences and thoughts about language with us. So to get us started off, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you grew up learning to speak English? My mother was a teacher. In fact, she was among the first three teachers in the elementary school that I later attended as a pupil, and even later than that, for which my husband became the principal. Oh, so, so you grew up surrounded by a community of teachers? Yes. And you felt like they definitely shaped the way you viewed language and the way you viewed English. Yes. My mother was very precise, English grammar specifically. And consequently, I grew up with proper English in the home. Okay. I didn't have to go to school to learn proper English. So grammar to you is not something that necessarily comes naturally. It's something that's very important to be instilled in young people or maybe people at any age. Grammar is a set of rules that people learn in order to use their language correctly. Absolutely. I think it's very important to have a basic knowledge of proper grammar. Right. And there are some expressions that really grate on me, and it bothers me to ha hear someone say, with he and his wife, or with, with you and I. Yeah. That, that um, sort of thing bothers me. Let me give you an example of something that struck me. Something I've heard a lot of people say is, if there are two people, John and Mary, and John is talking, he might talk about their house, and he'll say, Mary and I's house. Ooh, that, that, that would throw me for a loop. <laughs> right. I remember asking some of, my, um, some of my students what they would say in that situation, and some of my students came up with the solution of you know, Mary and I's house, and that sounded perfectly fine to them. Oh. So it must have been in the grammar of English <laughs> as they speak it. Well, I think you're absolutely right, Lee. That's as they speak it but certainly not as it is in the textbooks. Maybe we could transition a little bit into your experience with French. You were a French teacher and you supervised the foreign language department in the public schools, but there was a time when you didn't know any French. So what was it about the French language or what particular experiences or people was it that got you interested in that language? My debut into the French language is very interesting because I had had Latin first and at that time, French was the language of the world. It truly was, the mm -hmm. business world. Mm -hmm. and it was important to learn French. And I wanted to have Miss Mark as my Spanish teacher because I was really fearful of the French teacher. And I said, Mrs. Kinhart, I don't belong in this class. I'm supposed to be in a Spanish class. She said, well, we think you should be in this class. <laughs> so with that, um, introduction into the language. I, I wasn't very happy, but as soon as I started studying French and got all A's, straight A's, mm. I thought maybe I should like this language. Okay. And so yeah. I did. So you tried I it. I loved you, it. You tried it. You were successful at it. You, you thought it was interesting and you continued doing it through college. Oh, absolutely. I was a French major. I also know that you lived in a French speaking house. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yes, that was a graduate uh, experience, graduate school. Was there a minimum requirement of French you had to have to be admitted to the house? I'm not sure, but we had to sign a pledge to speak French uniquely. I got to the point that I was dreaming in French. Wow. <laughs> That's one of the benchmarks that people often imagine in their mind is if they can dream in this foreign language and they really will have learned it. Um, well, I could, and in technicolor. <laughs> How long did that take until you had felt so comfortable in the language that you could even speak it in your sleep? When one is uh, exposed to it 24 hours a day, it, it uh, happens a little faster than usual. But I was there for three, three long summers. Mm -hmm. And were there French speakers, uh, native French speakers in the house to guide you in case you didn't know things and to help you with the language? 
All the, the professors were native. Mademoiselle Ries, who was from Switzerland. We had Monsieur Beguet, Madame Beguet, and Dr. Sose, and Mademoiselle Agnès Duro. What have been your experiences traveling to any French-speaking countries? Oh, wonderful experiences. And I found that I could speak French in any country in Europe. Interestingly enough, when I was in Portugal, I found that I could speak French there, but not Spanish. And when I went to Spain, I found that I could speak French in Spain, but not Portuguese. Yeah, there is a pretty complicated history in the Iberian Peninsula of language, and language means a lot to those people. So I guess French being a neutral language from some faraway place, you know, country across the mountain, might be a common denominator among mm -hmm. the more educated populations mm -hmm. of those two countries. Mm -hmm. We learned that in many of the foreign tongues, the syllabication is very, very important in how to pronounce the language. In French, for example, the syllable ends, which is an open syllable, on a vowel mm -hmm. and begins with a consonant. Mm -hmm. But let's take the same word, which is spelled identically, in, spoken in English. The American English speaker will end the syllable on the consonant yeah. rather than on the vowel. And this disturbs me. Mm -hmm. I like to use the pronunciation that the people of the country would use, at least for the name of their country. Mm -hmm. As a sign of respect. As a sign of respect. Now, some people in the world of language might say that the real way to study language, or the best way to study language, is not to make any judgments on what is right and wrong, except when absolutely necessary. Would you agree with that statement, or do you think that it's part of studying language to sometimes prescribe the correct way of say, pronouncing a foreign term or pronouncing a term which may have different regional pronunciations? Good question. Let's take a menu. If there is a French term, then let's use it as a French term and let's pronounce it as a French term. Mm -hmm. If we can't use the proper French, then let's translate it into English and say it in English. We had on our menu the other day, haricots The waitresses and the waiters didn't know what they were supposed to say. Mm -hmm. That's the word for green beans. Yeah, uh, the... Th the slender. Okay, the French bean, beans. Yes. Let's not put it on the uh, on the menu as haricot vert if even the person who's in charge <laughs> of the dining room can't pronounce it or doesn't know what it means. Yeah, that's, uh, that's so surprising that they would have used that French term when there's a perfectly good English term that means the same thing to me at least. Well, of course, haricot vert is a certain kind, a special kind of bean. Oh. But another one I had somebody mispronounce couscous. I remember my introduction to couscous. It was in Nice, France, and I learned then and there that uh, couscous had originated in Northern Africa. So often in French, the final S is not pronounced. We know that. Because they like open syllables in yes. French, and they try to achieve but, them whenever possible. Right, but but we don't say cuckoo. No. We say couscous. Yeah. So... Um, Oh, the other day, I I was uh, having dinner with someone who said that she was going to buy something at a store named Sur la Table. <laughs> and I, to me, that, you know, I thought, it's Sur la Table. What would you suggest to someone who has no foreign language background and is surrounded in, in a world of foreign terms and expressions and doesn't know where they should start? I think you you better uh, get someone who can help you. Perhaps you have a friend or a neighbor, or, or you could take a little course. You might want a course just in how to pronounce uh, words on a French menu. Yeah. If, if you yeah. <laughs> no. Now, in the United States right now, there are a lot of languages being spoken. Would you be in favor of one language, or do you think there should be as many languages as possible spoken in this country? Well, I was privileged to hear one of your interviews, the one that you had with Mrs. Evelyn Johnson. And I remember that Mrs. Johnson said she thinks that in this country we should speak English. I agree 100% with Mrs. Johnson. I think that if you're going to live in America, do learn and speak English. Well, once I was uh, teaching a, a class, an, a night class at our church, and I had uh, a number of foreign students. The class ages ranged from about five to great-grandfathers. 
And uh, I remember that I felt it very important to control the vocabulary so that the students knew exactly what we were talking about and to build vocabulary on other vocabulary that's known vocabulary, mm -hmm. you know, working from the concrete to the semi-concrete to the abstract. I, I remember at the end of one of the classes, the students had done so very well. I said, oh, I'm so proud of you. And suddenly I said to myself, oh, Virginia, you know what you have done. You have not introduced this word proud. It's an abstract term. What in the world is wrong with you? You, you, know, you, should, you Yes, you are proud. So I said, class, what do I mean when I say that I'm very proud of you? There were two young men in the group, uh, all 15 and 16 years old, I think. And one of them raised his hand and he said, teacher, the, these students were very, very polite and had a great deal of respect for their teachers. And he raised his hand and he said, teacher, happy inside. I couldn't have said it better. Mm. That's a great story. Now, when you learned to become a foreign language teacher, what sort of things did you learn about how you should structure a language to someone who doesn't know it yet? Ah, that's a wonderful question. At La Maison Française, I was privileged to have a wonderful course in teaching French in French. Not a word of English crept into the classroom. It's a wonderful experience to expect the students to do this, and you can do it. Uh, you have the objects there, and you you use your little gestures and yeah. <laughs> and your sound effects. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of the website designers and I took a class together called TESOL Methods, Teaching English as a Second Language and Teaching Methods of, of yes. English as a Foreign Language. And that was one of the techniques that we learned. So we learned how to say some things in Hungarian. We learned the colors and the numbers and some other things without having any English, only Hungarian. Mm -hmm. And our teacher spoke Hungarian to us and showed us what we were supposed mm -hmm. to be learning. Mm -hmm. And it worked very well at the beginning level. Mm -hmm. well, what can you do past the beginning level if you're only speaking French? What other things? You move beyond showing the students and expecting the students to recall the vocabulary term. You have to move into, say, grammatical structures. Mm -hmm. How do you try to bring the grammatical structures to the forefront when you can't use English? It's my strong belief that teaching the students to sing French songs is a wonderful, wonderful means mm -hmm. of teaching structure and grammar. You take a very simple little song like, How Much Is That Doggy in the Window? Okay. May I use French? Oh, please, you can teach it to us. Combien coûte ce chien dans la vitrine? Now, in that little song, you have uh, combien coûte, how much does it cost, ce chien dans la vitrine. You're teaching la vitrine, which is feminine. Okay. Ce joli petit chien. You have two adjectives here. Joli precedes petit. Ce joli petit chien noir. And noir is the color which is after, which follows the noun. Uh -huh. There you have beautiful opportunity. Je, and when you say, je veux que ce chien soit à moi, you're using the subjunctive sure. after je veux, I wish. Yeah. Now, I remember hearing your of your teaching methods before. You would never use writing before the students learned what those languages sounded like because you were teaching French, and the French language sounds a lot different than it looks to an English speaker. Absolutely, um, yes. What's your thoughts on introducing the writing system or on using a spoken language before seeing the written oh, language? All right. The, the normal, natural procedure for learning language is listening. As a baby, the baby listens. Mm -hmm. Then speaking by imitating. Mm -hmm. So we have listening, speaking, and then we begin to read, read what we've heard, read what we've said, and then we get to writing. And that's the highest and strongest of the four levels 
of learning a language. Writing involves spelling, structure, so many things. So in order for someone to be a very good writer, he or she must have had a good foundation in listening, speaking, reading, and writing. What about for programs to integrate the four skills? What do you think the best way to do it is, or does it depend on the students you're talking about? Well, I think the best way to do it is in the beginning. We need some of our best teachers as beginning teachers, but so often we have the better teachers assigned to the advanced levels mm -hmm. where the students have already learned and they're doing very well. They're good students in the first place and they're, they've yeah. chosen the language or else they wouldn't be taking advanced work. But if they have begun with these skills in that order, they're ready when the proper time comes. Mm -hmm. So it's almost foolproof. You can't go wrong. Well, if you follow that procedure. If you follow the procedure. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I understand also that you took some linguistics classes when you were in college. What was linguistics like when you were taking it, and what sort of things did you learn? I integrated French and English when I wrote my paper on linguistics. Oh, I so, so you, you wrote about um, some phenomenon in, in the French language? Oh, I certainly did, about Molière, and I called it uh, Les Nouveaux de Langue, explaining from Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme by Molière that we have a, a certain level of language, le niveau de langue, the levels of language. We have a certain level for, let's say, the working class and the educated class and the various levels. And we don't expect um, someone with a little bit of education to speak using the language that someone with a PhD should be using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes these levels are called registers, and so mm -hmm. each one of us has many different registers, maybe three or four registers that we're comfortable with, and we can switch back and forth yes. depending yes. on the situation. Yes. So if I was speaking to you, I would speak differently than if I were speaking to, say, a head of state, and I would speak to the head of state differently than I would to my best friends or apartment mates. Yes, right. So. The direction that linguistics went in was one where Chomsky's ideas became very popular. And for Chomsky, language is structure. It's not so, it is about meaning, but the, the further you can go with investigating language structure, the more you can find out that that structure has to do with the meaning itself. And there were a lot of things about language universals at this time, and linguists are still trying to find out what some of these language universals are. But I was just wondering how you would react to that idea that language is structure. Do you think language is structure? I do. In a, yes, yes. But language is much more than structure. I happen to have had the privilege of hearing Chomsky once. Now, don't ask me about the lecture. I don't remember much about it. But I did hear him, and I remember his, his name from the days when I was studying linguistics mm -hmm. and when I went to conferences regarding the teaching of French or languages mm -hmm. because I was supervising a variety of languages. But let's see, I think that structure and meaning are interwoven. We build on structure and we develop meaning. Well, thanks very much to our interviewee. This has been my pleasure. This has been Lee and Virginia Ballard for FloridaLinguistics.com. Please visit the website for an archive of the podcast episodes, general information about linguistics, and a way to get in touch. Thanks for listening, and see you again soon. Florida Linguistics.